Section 4.3, Graphing Functions. We've already looked at some graphing concepts so far this semester, but they've all been kind of scattered throughout different sections of the book. So at this point, we're going to make an attempt to unify those all in one place. So here are our steps to sketching the graph of f of x. We're going to start out by identifying the domain of f of x. So typically what we're talking about here is looking for zero denominators or square roots of negatives. And then we're going to find x and y intercepts and also any asymptotes. When we're thinking about domain, that's going to bring up the vertical asymptotes, but we'll also look for slant asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes at this point. From there, we're going to move to calculating the first derivative. And that's going to help us think about uh, max, min, increasing, decreasing, and so on. And so we're going to want to calculate or determine the critical points. Those are going to be our potential max and min spots. And they come from zero derivative or undefined derivative. And then we're going to use a sign chart to start trying to analyze this data and find intervals of increasing and decreasing. When you do get to this point and you're doing your sign chart, you should include x's from your vertical asymptotes. So they're not critical points because they're not places where they're not in the domain of the function, therefore can't be a spot where you get a max or min, but you can get a switch from increasing to decreasing around a vertical asymptote, so it's important to include them on your sign charts. Once you have that sign chart set up, you want to identify local max and min, and even though those are y values, we want to write them when we're in the graphing mode as an ordered pair, so that we can graph, think of you know them as a point on the graph instead of just a height. Then we'll move on to the second derivative. And when we do that, it's to determine potential changes of concavity. So we'll look at spots where the function could change its concavity. That would be places where the derivative is zero or undefined. That includes vertical asymptotes, which would always come from an undefined place. So we're going to use the sign chart with those to think about where's the function concave up and concave down, as well as identifying points of inflection. And those points of inflection we want to write as an ordered pair. We're always supposed to do that, but it's especially useful to be writing down these key points as ordered pairs when we're in graphing mode. Step nine, we're going to take advantage of any symmetry to help us sketch the graph. So sometimes functions will have some symmetries that if you know them, you can draw one half and then quickly get the other half from that. One of them is if the function is even, then it's going to be symmetric about the y-axis. And a function will be even if replacing x by negative x and simplifying takes you back to the original function you started with. Some examples of functions that are even in the trig function family, we've got y equals cosine of x. There's other trig functions too, but that's the primary one, primary one that's even. And then polynomials can be even if every term has an even degree. So something like x to the 8th plus 7x to the 4th minus 13. So notice there can be odd coefficients, but it's got to be even exponents, and the constant term is considered to be degree zero, because it's like there's an x to the zero there, so that still counts as an even term. So if all your terms are even, you'll get an even function if it's a polynomial. For odd functions, that happens when you replace negative x by x, and you simplify, and you get almost what you started, just with a negative out front. If your function is odd, then it will be symmetric about the origin. And some examples of functions that are odd. In the trig family, we have y equals sine of x. And then in the polynomial family, it would be one where every term has an odd degree. So something like x to the fifth plus 4x cubed. 
and minus 7x. That would be an example of an odd function where the degrees of your terms are 5, 3, and 1, all odd numbers. Coefficients being even like 4 don't matter. All right, and then our final step is to get to work on the graphing. And when you're going to do a big, complicated graph, it's nice to know where to start. So I would suggest starting your graph with any known ordered pairs and then also with any asymptotes. That usually gives kind of a nice framework from which you can try and draw the graph. All right, so let's move down and look at an example. So we're gonna start off with a polynomial function, y equals x cubed plus six x squared plus nine x. And we're gonna try and apply our procedure to this one. All right, so the first thing we're supposed to look at here is intercepts. So to do intercepts, it's usually useful to factor the function. So let's jump in there and try that. So the first thing I'll do is factor out the GCF of x, and that would leave behind an x squared plus 6x plus 9. And then I would ask the question for this part right here, what are two numbers that multiply to 9 and add up to 6? That would be plus 3 and plus 3. So this will end up being x times x plus 3 squared, since it was a plus 3 both times. We'll get that as a repeated factor. So there's our factored form of the function, and that's going to be useful in helping us find intercepts. So let's move on to those intercepts now. The y-intercept you can go to the original function, and what you want to do is just plug in a zero for x and see what you get for y. In this case, every term would get knocked out if you put a zero in there, so the y value is just going to be zero. So zero, zero is our y-intercept. And the way you find x-intercepts is to think about when is the function equal to zero. So that would be replacing y by a 0, or setting the function equal to 0 is another way of thinking about that. But notice right here we have one where y is equal to 0 already, so that's not only the y-intercept, it is also an x-intercept. But then you can look at this and say, is there anywhere else that it would be equal to 0? And from this factor right here, you would get x equals negative 3. From this one, you get the x equals 0, but we already have that in our list. So for our intercept over here, we're going to list negative 3, 0 as an intercept. So that gives us two ordered pairs on the graph. That'll be helpful. And then we'd normally think about asymptotes, but to have asymptotes, you need division. And so a polynomial function won't have any asymptotes. So next, we move on to the derivative. So we're going to go ahead and take the first derivative of this function. So y prime would be equal to 3x squared plus 12x plus 9, just using the power rule, since this is polynomial. I see a GCF here of 3 goes into all of those, so I'll factor out that 3. And that leaves x squared plus 4x plus 3. And then we have a binomial here that we could try and factor, trying to think of two numbers that multiply to 3 and add up to 4. 3 and 1 get that job done. So y prime is equal to, we have that 3 out front, and then we have x plus 1, x plus 3. And then we want to think about where is that equal to 0, where is it undefined, and the two places are negative 1 and negative 3. We've actually got three factors here, 1, 2, 3. So you might expect three critical numbers, but you only get critical numbers from factors that have a variable in them. So that 3 out front isn't going to lead to any critical numbers. All right, from there, we want to start summarizing first derivative info on a sign chart. We're going to have a sign chart for f double prime later, so it's important to label this. Put our two critical points on there, negative 3 and negative 1. And then you can do testing to fill in the charts, or you can look at end behavior is another way to do it. So for end behavior, you look at a function and say, what's going on with its lead coefficient? That's the most important part. So if you thought about a function y equals 3x squared, that would be a parabola that opens up. So both on the left and the right, it would go up towards positive infinity. Since our first derivative looks like such a parabola, it should have positives on the right 
and positives on the left, because again, a y equals positive 3x squared would be a parabola opening up on both the left and the right. And then another thing that you can look at is your exponents. So what are our exponents on this one? Let's mark them in red. This is x plus 1 to the first and x plus 3 to the first. And the critical numbers that come from those will have sign changes at them if you have an odd exponent. So since these are both odd, we should have sign changes at both critical numbers. So what does that mean? At negative 3, you have different signs on each side. So since it's positive to the left, it would have to be negative on the right of the negative 3. Negative 1 also comes from a factor that's to an odd power, so it should have different signs on both sides, and we did get a negative and a positive. So I like using this approach to filling in the sign chart where I think about end behaviors and the exponent on the factors that led to my critical numbers because it's quicker than testing points. So I'll keep showing you that and hopefully you'll get the hang of it. But anytime you feel uncomfortable with a section, you can always test values. So we could plug in a value like negative 5 into the first derivative to verify these positive values on the left. We could pick a value like negative 2 to verify the negative here, pick a value like 0 or 4 or something to the right of negative 1 to verify the pluses on the right-hand side. So testing the points in the derivative is still an option, but it's not as fast as thinking about end behavior and the exponents on your factors. All right, so what's going on here? We have increasing and then decreasing and then increasing again based on the sign of the derivative. So if you're going up and then down at negative 3, this would be a local max. And then as you go into negative 1, you're going down. As you go out of it, you're going up. So that would be a local min. So it'd be nice to know what those ordered pairs are. Write those down, and then we can use them when we graph later. So at negative 3, we get a local max. So the local max is the y value, but I'm going to write it as an ordered pair because when you're drawing a graph, to be able to graph these or plot these ordered pairs is very useful. So it's negative 3, and then you would want to plug that into the original function and see what comes out. And if you do that, I've already kind of noticed this up top, but if you put negative 3 into that factor, you get a 0, and then 0 times whatever is going to be 0. So negative 3, 0 is that local max. And then for the local minimum, that's occurring at negative 1. That is not a y value we have already. And to save time, I'm just going to give it to you. But if you take that negative 1 and plug it in to each of the x spots in the original function, that's going to produce your y value for the local min. And that y value turns out to be negative 4 when you plug all that in. All right, so that takes care of everything with the first derivative. So now we want to move to the second derivative. So. Let's look at y double prime. So y double prime, we have different versions of y prime written. If you try and use the factored versions to get your second derivative, you have to use the product rule. So I'm going to go back to this version right here, which is just a polynomial. So I can just use the power rule. So the second derivative would be 6x plus 12. And then if we factor a 6 out, we get 6 times x plus 2 which, by the way, is to the first, which will be useful when we think about our sign chart here in a minute. But there's only one place that's zero or undefined, which is negative two. So now we'll make a sign chart for our first derivative with just that one key number on it, negative two. So if we want to think about end behavior here, then we would look at the lead coefficient of our second derivative, which is this 6x. So what does a line like y equals 6x look like? Well, because it has a positive slope on the right, it's going up to infinity. On the left, it's going down to negative infinity. So it should be that based on end behavior, we have pluses on the right-hand side of that critical point and negatives on the left. And then, according to this exponent, which is odd, we should have different signs on both sides. So we see that on our chart too. So those are things that are kind of confirming each other. And then, of course, you could test numbers like negative 4 and 0 into the second derivative to confirm those negatives and positives if you'd like as well. 
And then let's make a note about concavity. The negative second derivative tells us it would be concave down to the left of negative 2 and concave up to the right of negative 2. So even though it talks about intervals for increasing, decreasing, and intervals for concavity, unless there's a question that specifically says write the intervals, you can just kind of visualize those intervals on the sign charts, and that's fine with me, rather than writing out the specific intervals and unions or whatever as needed. Just a quick point about the odd or even. I guess before that, we should get our points of inflection taken care of, and we do have one. So... We have a change in concavity at negative 2. So whatever goes with negative 2 would create an ordered pair for a point of inflection. I'll just call that a pi, and it's going to occur at negative 2 something. And again, you get that something from coming back up to the original function, plugging the negative 2 in for all those x's and see what you get out. And having already kind of prepared that earlier, I know the answer there is negative 2. And then going back up and looking at that original function a little bit more for odd or even. So, again, here's our original function. What are its exponents? 3, which is odd, 2, which is even, and 1, which is odd. If you have a polynomial function with a mixture of odd and even exponents in it, then it's neither odd nor even, which means it's not symmetric about the y-axis and it's not symmetric about the origin. All right, so we've got all of our information gathered. And so now it's time to go to the graph. All right, I went ahead and drew in an x and a y axis already. And I kind of put them in maybe what seems like a strange spot to you because I didn't draw them through the center. So I want to kind of explain why that is, and then we'll pick our scale. But we're supposed to start out our graph by plotting the ordered pairs and any asymptotes. So we don't have any asymptotes, so we can just focus on the ordered pairs. So let's go highlight all of those in orange. So we've got 0, 0, that's at the origin. We have negative 3, 0. What other ordered pairs did we get? Negative 3, 0, repeated here. Negative 1, negative 4. And then our point of inflection down here at the bottom, the negative 2, 2. So there's all of our points. And what I'd like you to notice is all the numbers that aren't 0 are negative. And that kind of means all the action is going to be happening in the bottom left quadrant. So I made that a bigger zone than any of the others, since that's where most of the action is going to take place. And then the other thing that I would want to point out about those numbers is none of them are really big. So if the biggest number we have is that negative 4, then we can easily just do a numbering that's simple, like 1, I guess I'll do this in black. But we can just go 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, four, five, six, and so on for the x's, and everything's going to fit. You can't do that if one of your x values on a point you're going to plot is negative 20. You've got to pick a scale that's going to fit that in. But all these numbers are small, so one, two, three in both directions is going to work fine for us. Everything's going to fit. All right, so let's go ahead and let's, I'll switch to red for all these specific points just so we kind of have a good view of them. So 0, 0 is a point on our graph. And then negative 3, 0 is a point on our graph. And negative 3, 0 down there for a local max. And negative 1, negative 4 for a local min. And then a point of inflection at negative 2, negative 2. So there's all the specific points on our graph. And now we want to connect them with a graph that matches up with Ideas like local max, local min, and also increasing, decreasing, concave up, concave down. So for the local max and local min, those occur at places where you've got a horizontal tangent. So our local max at negative 3, the graph's going to go through there kind of horizontally. And then if you look on the sign chart down at the bottom for the first derivative, at negative 3, that's in the concave down zone, so that graph is going to bend downward. And then we have this other point as a target at negative 2, 2. So I'll bend downward and go through there. And on the left, I'll just kind of have this parabola type bend downward and put an arrow on it. Okay, how about our local min? That's at negative 1, negative 4. So I'll do the same idea of starting off with like a horizontal tangent. But then looking down here at the second derivative chart, 
we've got a positive second derivative, so we're going to go through that in a concave up fashion. So I want that to kind of look like a parabola that opens up and bend that into that point of inflection. And on the other side, I'm going to do the same thing, but I also have to target that intercept at 0, 0 as I bend up. And then I'm just going to keep going through. So there's my stab at the graph. And now I just want to make sure I don't have anything that contradicts my sign charts. So let's look at, did we go through all the points? Yeah, we've marked all four of those in red, and I can kind of see that. Did we make negative 3, 0 a local max? Yes. Did we make negative 1, negative 4 a local min? Yes. Did we change concavity at negative 2, negative 2? So let's go ahead and focus our attention there for a second. That's this spot right here. Did we change concavity there? And it looks like, yes, we did. On the left of that, we had concave down. And that matches what we had on our sign chart. And to the right of negative 2, we had concave up. And that matches our sign chart for the second derivative. Let me get rid of those bits of highlighting now. And think about increasing, decreasing. So we were supposed to go increasing before negative 3 and after negative 1. And decreasing in between. So look from negative 3 to negative 1. We did have that decreasing stretch. And before that, before negative 3, it was increasing. And after negative 1, it was increasing. So that all matches the first derivative chart. So usually if you've got a mistake in there, I guess maybe even always, if you've got a mistake in there, it's going to contradict something that you've done in your chart somewhere. So when you think you've got the graph right, just go back and double check. Do this increasing and decreasing match on my graph and my chart? Just concave up and concave down match on my chart and on my graph. And if all that's matching and you've hit all your ordered pairs, you're probably in pretty good shape. All right, let's go ahead and look at another example, still with those previous page directions of graph the function using the procedures that we came up with. So we're looking at y equals x squared plus 12 over 2x plus 1. And they've given us fairly simplified versions of the first and second derivative to help speed up some of the work. All right, so looking at the list, the first thing we want to think about is domain issues. And when you have a rational function, polynomial over a polynomial, the only issue that you're really worried about is what if you have a zero denominator? So what if 2x plus 1 was equal to 0? That would be a problem. So we don't want 2x plus 1 to equal 0, which means that we don't want x to equal negative 1 half. If we do, it's going to be a problem. Well, what kind of problem? If you plug negative 1 half into the denominator, you get a 0. But if you plug negative 1 half into the top, you get something that's a constant that's not 0. And when plugging a number into a, a fraction gives you 0 on the bottom but not on the top, that's where vertical asymptotes come from. So see, there's a look at how starting off looking at domain leads right into vertical asymptotes. And so we'll also look at other asymptotes along the way, but we've kind of already stumbled on one asymptote just looking at the domain issue. The next thing in our list actually is intercepts, though, so we'll go there. Often I think it's a little bit easier to find y-intercepts than x-intercepts, so I'll do that first. You always just plug a 0 in for x and see what that gives you. So plugging that into the original function, the 0 in those two spots makes them go away. So if those two spots were gone, we'd be left with just 12 over 1, so 0 over 12 is our y-intercept. And then how about for x-intercepts? When you have a fraction, it can only be... So first of all, to find x-intercepts, you want to set the fraction equal to 0, or the function equal to 0. And when that function is a fraction, the only way that it's going to equal 0 is if its numerator equals 0. So if you take that numerator and set it equal to 0, you get x squared equals negative 12, which isn't possible with a real number. When you square a real number, you're never going to get a negative. So that means there's no... In, no x-intercepts, and that may seem like a setback, like, oh, well, that's too bad because x-intercepts help us graph. But in a way, no x-intercepts is also useful information. It tells you that at no point while you're drawing the graph are you allowed to cross the x-axis. You can 
be on top at one point and below at another, but you can't draw a path that connects them and goes through the x-axis because that would create an x-intercept and we don't have any. So we want to keep that in mind as we draw our graph. All right, but speaking of asymptotes, which we talking about up here, there's one of them. We're going to get a vertical asymptote if x equals or at x equals negative one half. So the vertical line x equals negative one half is going to be an asymptote on our graph. I was tempted, by the way, to just throw that onto the graph right now as, as we set it. But you really want to organize all of your ordered pairs and all of your asymptotes before you graph them to make sure you pick a scale that can fit everything. So what about other asymptotes? Let me go ahead and get rid of these markings that I put on the graph so we have a clean version of it. When you're looking for asymptotes other than the vertical, we're talking about horizontal or possibly slant, you want to look at those lead coefficients and see what that ratio is. And if the top is bigger than the bottom in degree, x squared compared to x to the first, by, if they're bigger on the top than the bottom by exactly one, then you're always going to have a slant asymptote. So we're going to do some hunt here for a slant asymptote then, because this fits that category. And then recall, if you're looking for a slant asymptote, the way you find that is to do a long division, where you take the numerator and divide it by the denominator. So... We're going to go ahead and do that process. We go ahead and make a little space for that. So we're going to put x squared plus 12 underneath. I'm going to write x squared plus 0x plus 12. The way long division works, you usually want things in descending order underneath with no missing terms. So if you have no x to the first, put into 0x can be useful in terms of keeping the spacing good. It's not absolutely mandatory, but it is helpful. All right, so now we want to start the long division. So you take the first term of what's underneath, x squared, divide by the first term of what's out front, 2x. In this case, we get 1x to cancel, and the 2 does not. So there's an x left over, and that 2 in the denominator is like a 1 half. So our lead term is 1 half x. So I'll go ahead and write that up top. So no, sometimes people line it up with the other x term, but you can just put it wherever up there. And then take that first term of your answer, 1 half x, multiply it with what's out front. So 1 half x times 2x gives us x squared, because the 1 half and the 2 cancel, and the x times x is x squared. And then 1 half x times 1 is plus 1 half x. And then when you're doing the long division process, the next step is to take that product right here that you just got and subtract that from what's above. So if you do that, x squared minus x squared, those are going to cancel, and then 0 minus 1 half x would be negative 1 half x. Make sure you don't just combine like terms, because you won't get cancellation on the lead terms, and you also will forget to get the negative on that second term if you just combine like terms without thinking about the negative out front. All right, at that point, you just repeat the process. So... Make a little bit more space for us to work here, but we need to take that negative one half x. Oh, sorry, one other step is before we do the next loop is to bring the 12 down. So we'll do that. And then take the negative one half x, divide that by what's out front, which is the 2x. The x's are going to cancel. And this 2 doesn't cancel the other 2, but because it's a complex fraction, it's going to move down. You can multiply top and bottom by 2. You can do negative 1 half divided by 2. Or you can just do this trick and move the 2 down. But any of those processes are going to lead you to negative 1 fourth for the next term in our answer. So we would have a minus 1 fourth out here. And that's kind of enough work to get your slant asymptote. So I'm going to just go ahead and write that down so that you know the shortcut. But once you get there, you've got it. The slant asymptote is going to be y equals whatever you have at this point when you get to a constant term. So y equals 1 half x minus 1 fourth is going to be the slant asymptote for this. I'll go ahead and continue on just to kind of explain why that's your end piece. But if you multiply that negative 1 fourth that's up top 
So multiply that negative one fourth and don't forget the negative by what's out front to kind of keep this process going. So negative one fourth times two x is negative one half x. And negative one fourth times positive one is negative one fourth. Next step in the process is to take what you just got there and subtract it from what's above. The negative one half x will cancel with the negative of negative one half x because those two negatives will make a positive. And then you'll end up with 12 plus a fourth. And let's see, I think that's 49 fourths. I guess we'll do that in blue, but 49 fourths. And that's your remainder term. So officially what you do is you take 49 fourths and put that 49 fourths here, sorry, we need to clean that up a little bit. Take that 49 fourths and put that over the original denominator of 2x plus 1. And if you think about what happens to this whole answer as x goes to infinity, that last term is going to go to 0 because it has an x in the denominator, but just a constant in the numerator. So when you go out to positive infinity or negative infinity, that remainder term doesn't really matter anymore, or it has very little effect, and your graph starts to look like the remaining piece, which is the y equals 1 half x minus 1. So that's our slant asymptote. All right, so all that, and we're only through steps 1 and 2. So got some more work to do, but fortunately, because they've helped us out with derivatives, that work's going to go a little bit faster. So let's go ahead and see where we are space-wise here. Let's go ahead and fence that off. And we'll do our first derivative work over here in the upper right. All right, so now we want to start analyzing the first derivative. And they've already given us the first derivative, but when I copy it down here, I'm going to start doing some factoring. There's a 2 common to all of the terms in the numerator, so I'm going to factor that 2 out. That would leave x squared plus x minus 12, and then all of that would be over the 2x plus 1 squared. If we factor the numerator, it's going to help us see our critical numbers. So we'll keep working on that factoring, trying to factor the binomial in the numerator by trying to think of two numbers that multiply to negative 12 and add up to plus 1. So plus 4 and negative 3 add up to, or multiply to negative 12 and add up to plus 1. So that should be the factoring of the numerator. Denominator is already factored, so I'm just going to copy that down as 2x plus 1 squared. And then we want to think about for our sign chart for f prime, any places where the first derivative is either equal to 0 or undefined. So we've got three factors there with a variable in them. Each of those three factors can lead to a number to go on our sign chart. So we need a negative 4, a positive 3, and a negative 1 half. So I'm going to go ahead and write all of those on there. So the negative 4 off to the left, the positive 3 off to the right, and the negative 1 half somewhere in between. Don't worry about the scale too much because we're just trying to figure out increasing, decreasing, local max, stuff like that. And the spacing is important for that part of the procedure. Probably a good idea to remind ourselves that this is a sign chart for f prime because we will have a sign chart for f double prime before too long. I'm going to go ahead and start this one out by actually testing a point. Zero is not one of our key numbers on our sign chart, and it's usually an easy one to plug in to the derivative to test. So let's go back here. I'll erase this stuff on the derivative. And let's go ahead and think about plugging zero in. And actually, I guess I'm going to highlight those same things again. But if we take those numbers and we put the zero in for all those x's, we're left with negative 24 over 1, with negative 24 over 1 squared, but it's still negative 24. So when you plug zero in, you get a negative for the first derivative, and zero would be in this section of the number line here, so I'm going to write negatives there. And then I'm going to use the exponents on my factors of the first derivative to decide if I have sign changes or not. The two factors that don't have an exponent written have factors, or sorry, exponents of 1, which are odd. We will get sign changes at the critical points that come from those two numbers. The key number from the denominator, negative 1 half, comes from a factor that's squared, so we will not get a sign change there. So let's see how that's useful. 
Let's go through and do some different highlighting. So the three comes from this factor, which has an odd power. So that means there's going to be a sign change for the derivative at three, and that just means different signs on both sides. So since the left-hand side has negatives, the right-hand side must have positives. So how about the negative one-half? The negative one-half comes from the denominator, which has an even power, so it will not have a sign change. That doesn't mean positives or negatives. It means the same on both sides. So since to the right of negative one-half we currently have negatives, it has to be the same to the left of negative one-half. And then finally, the negative one, negative four comes from this factor, which was to an odd power, so it will have a sign change. It has negatives on its right, so it must have positives on its left. Getting that trick down is so much faster than plugging in messy test points into that fraction, where x goes in three spots and you've got a square in the denominator, all this stuff. So if you can get good at this, uh, it's really helpful for speeding up the process. All right, other thing that's worth noting is which critical numbers on this line came from the numerator. That would be negative 4 and 3, which were defined points for the derivative. But the negative 1 half was a place where it was undefined. So I'm going to put those solid and open circles just to remind me the difference between why they were on the chart. 0 in the numerator so horizontal tangent versus zero in the de denominator, derivative is undefined. All right, and then let's think about those pluses and minuses. If we have a plus section, that's an increasing part of our graph, and then the negatives afterwards are a decrease. The point in between is defined, so we go up and then down. That's going to be a local max there. And then just reminding ourselves with that open circle, that was a vertical asymptote at x equals negative one-half. So... That's not going to be a max or min because it's not a defined point on the function. So now focusing on the 3, we're decreasing on the way in, and we're increasing on the way out, and that is a defined point on the derivative. So that's going to be a local extrema, and if we're going down on the way in and up on the way out, that's going to be a local minimum at 3. So then the next task is to start thinking about what are the ordered pairs for those extrema. So our local max at negative 4. So our local max is at negative 4, but we want to think about the ordered pair for graphing purposes. So we want the y value. So how do we get those y values? We come back up here to our original function, and in place of the x in the top and the bottom, we're going to plug the negative 4. So we put a negative 4 there and there, and then simplify and see what we get. And I've done that already and I got negative 4. So kind of a coincidence. You put negative 4 in, and you get negative 4 back out. And then we would do the same thing for the local minimum, which occurs at 3. We'd plug that 3 into the original function, and it turns out that also produces the same output as what we put in. So that's not the normal, but it happened in both of these cases. All right, so there's kind of a full processing of the first derivative, which has produced a local max and a local min that we'll be able to plot here in a little bit. So now we want to finish this off thinking about the second derivative. So they gave us the second derivative already. y prime equals 98 over 2x plus 1 to the third. So let's write that down and then analyze that. So y double prime equals 98 over 2x plus 1 to the third. So when you go to do your sign chart for f double prime, you want to think about where is the numerator and denominator equal to 0. Well, the numerator is a constant, so it's never equal to 0. And the denominator is going to be equal to 0 at negative 1 half. We've already kind of been through this with that denominator, right? And then also, because it came from the denominator, it's an undefined point on the second derivative. And it is, in fact, if we go back to the original, an undefined point on the original function. So it cannot be a point of inflection, but it can be a place where the graph changes concavity. So we can check that by plugging things in. So what if I just plugged a 0 into this second derivative? So if I plug the 0 in right there, I get 98 over 1 cubed, which is a positive. 
and zero is to the right of negative one half, so that would be over here. And then this is an odd exponent, so we're gonna have a sign change, so it'll be negative on the other side, and therefore concave down here and concave up there. But no point of inflection because negative one half is not a point on the actual graph. All right, so now we wanna head back up and try and plot all of this into a coherent graph. All right, so now that we're going to go to the graphing mode, we want to make sure we pick a scale that will include all of our key info. So let's highlight that key info real quick. Ordered pair, 0, 12. Vertical asymptote, x equals negative 1 half. Notice the 12, by the way, it's a big y value, so we can't go 1, 2, 3, 4 type of numbering on the y value. What else have we got? We've got the slant asymptote, which has a y-intercept of negative one-fourth. We've got negative four, negative four is a point on our graph, and three, three is a point on our graph. We want to make sure all those things fit. And then we had no points of inflection from the bottom. So most of our numbers are fairly reasonable, but we do have this one 12 right there. So that's going to be an issue that makes us alter our scale a little bit. So we just need to make sure that we fit that on. So how about if on our vertical, we make every notch three? So this would be, sorry, let me switch the pen. So this would be three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, and we have to be consistent on the way down. So three, six, nine, negative 12, and 15 and 18 negatives. It's a common misconception that you need to do the same scale on the x and the y. That is not true. And since all of our x values are reasonable size numbers, I'm just going to do that in ones. So we have negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and positive 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on there. So we want to plot now our asymptotes and also our ordered pairs. I'm going to start off with the asymptotes. We have x equals negative one-half. That would be a vertical line about like this. Now that's supposed to be a dashed line, so let me see if I can change the style there and make that dashed. I can. So there is our vertical asymptote. And now for our, hor our slant asymptote, we have negative one-fourth as a point on the slant asymptote. So that's just like barely below the origin, because remember our vertical scale is three. And then let's see if we can get another ordered pair on that that's kind of nice. So how about if we take that slant asymptote? We know that if you put in zero, you get out negative one fourth. What if you put in six? Six times a half would be three, minus a quarter would be 2.75. So if you go over six, you're just a little bit below three for that slant asymptote. So over to six and just a little bit below three, which remember three is our scale on the vertical. So it's just below the first grid line. So now I want a line that goes through those two points. Let's see if I can pull that off. Look how messy that is and then the magic it becomes straight for me. And then let's go ahead and make that dashed because it's not actually part of our graph. It's just to help us draw the graph. All right, so there's my two asymptotes. Let me now put some specific points on the graph. We have 0, 12. That's up here. What else have we got down below? We've got negative 4, 4. So left 4, down 4 would be right about there. Got to remember always here our vertical scale was negative three. So down one and a third is actually going to be down to negative four. And our other point was over three, up three, which would be right there. All right, let's try and draw that upper right hand portion first. And let's think about some key details that we want to make sure we get in that upper right hand portion of the graph. So what's happening to the right of our vertical asymptote. We are decreasing and then increasing, but during that whole time, we are concave up. So let me give that a shot and then we can double check it. 
So I'm going to draw up towards that vertical asymptote through this point, bending to the other one. So that's all decreasing. I want to go horizontal tangent there because that's a local min. And then I need to keep the concave up bend. But if I try and go too steep on that, I'm not going to go towards that slant asymptote. So maybe something like that. I have to be careful not to curve down too quickly towards the slant asymptote because this point is the minimum. And if I go keep going down, it's not going to be the minimum. So I have to bend up through there, but so gradually that I can still approach that slant asymptote. I think we've achieved what we needed to on that one. We've got concave up the whole way, decreasing until we get to that minimum. And then I've made a very slow increase, but it still is an increase from there. We don't have as much information for this other one, but we know that this point right here is a max, and we know we don't have any x-intercepts, so I can't go that way because it would cause an x-intercept, so I have to go this way. Oh, that was messy. Let me try that again. I need to go this way to try and approach that asymptote. And then if this is going to be a max, I can't go up from there to get to the line, so I have to kind of just go out that way. I'm going to back that up a little bit. I want to keep getting closer to the line, so maybe something like that. Kind of a tricky one to draw, but we want to make sure that's concave down the whole way because we had concave down right here to the left of negative one-half. And we needed to make sure we got a local max increasing and then decreasing. Very slight increase. Very slight increase right there. But then a max and then it goes down to create all the pieces we need to. All right, so there's, there's the full graph. Anytime you have one this messy, feel free to go to the graphing calculator and check out some of the features. Probably a good idea, so we'll do that real quick for this one. All right, let's go take a quick look at this on the graphing calculator, see how good of a match we get. So for the y equals, we'll enter our original function, which is going to be x raised to the second plus 12. That's all my numerator, so I'm putting that in parentheses. And then divided by the denominator, also in parentheses, 2x plus 1. And then I'm going to add the equation for the slant asymptote as well. Even though that's not officially part of our graph, it was something that we drew to help us do a better job with the graph. And so we'll put that on there as well. And it's going to show up in red. So the green will be our function and the red will be the asymptote. Before I hit graph, I'm going to go into window settings and just make those match what we did. On our grid, the left side was negative six and the right side was positive six. And our lower edge of the grid was negative 18 and the upper part was positive 18. If you set up your window to match your grid, it's easier to check that the graph is correct. So now let's hit graph and cross our fingers. Hope we, we see what we drew on our grid. So again, the green is our function. And let's go ahead and do some tracing. There's our y-intercept at 0, 12. As we come across at 3, notice it clicks in there and says 3, 3, and it says minimum on the grid, so that's a low point. And it does increase as it leaves there. But notice the gap between it and the asymptote are closing as you go to the right. And if we come over here on the left, we're going to click in somewhere right there for a local max. It does decrease as it leaves there. And as it decreases, notice the gap is narrowing between it and the axis, or the slant asymptote, I should say. Now if I change this and I zoom out, we can see that as we see further to the right and the left, we really see the blending together of our graph in the slant asymptote. So they really do start to get close together, just not in the grid that we saw. All right, looks like we did a pretty good job with that graph, despite how tough it was. All right, let's look at another example that presents some new issues to us. So y equals x plus three times x raised to the two thirds. To help out with intercepts, we're gonna start this one by factoring out the GCF. Both of the terms have an x. So we'll take out the smaller power of x. One of the x's is to the first, the other one is to the two-thirds. So we'll take out x to the two-thirds. 
From the first one, that's x to the 1, so you take the 1 minus 2 thirds, and that would leave 1 third left for the exponent. On the next term, the 3 was not messed with, so it'll still be there, and the x to the 2 thirds was factored out, so it will be gone. So there's the factored form of our function. And now let's start thinking about intercepts. If I plug a 0 in for x, then that will eliminate that term and that term completely, and we'll just get a 0 for the y. So 0, 0 is a point on our graph, and that's on the origin, which is on the x and the y-axis. So that is both our an x and a y-intercept. And then looking still for any other x-intercepts, we want to set the original function equal to 0. And we've already factored it, so that means either this factor equals 0, which would be x equals 0. We have that intercept right here already. Or maybe this factor right here is 0. So let's explore that one a little bit. That would mean that x to the 1 third would have to be equal to negative 3. And because this is a odd power in the denominator, that means it's an odd root. So it can be a negative. And we can solve this by cubing both sides of the equation. And that leads to x equals negative 27. So negative 27 comma 0 would be an x-intercept for us. So negative 27, 0. And then worth a quick mention, I didn't talk about domain. Uh, and we do have a root here, but as I mentioned earlier, it's an odd root. And the odd root, you can have negatives, positives, or 0 in there. So we really have no domain issues on this one. So I just jumped into the intercepts because of that. All right, so now let's move on to analyzing the derivatives. So we'll start with the first derivative. And we'll want to go with the unfactored form to take the derivative, because then we can just use the power rule. Derivative of x is 1. And then for the next term, we bring down the 2 thirds. There's already a 3 out front. And then the x is to the power 1 less, so 2 thirds minus 1 would be negative one-third. These two threes right here will cancel. And then we want to try and simplify this a little bit. So first of all, just with that canceling going on, we have one plus two x to the negative one-third. All right, now let's work on simplifying that derivative. So I'm just going to leave the one alone for now. And then on that term to the right, I'm going to take the x to the negative one-third from the numerator, move that down to the denominator. That would make it x to the positive one-third. And then what I'm going to do is try and get a common denominator. So I'm going to write the 1 as 1 over 1. Then I'm going to multiply the top to, by x to the one-third and multiply the bottom by x to the one-third. And that will create a common denominator for me. So when I do that, my denominator is that common x to the one-third, and the numerator is x to the one-third plus two. And we want to start moving on to sign chart for this derivative, so we want to think about where the numerator and denominator are equal to zero. For the numerator to be equal to zero, you would need x to the one-third to be equal to negative two. That means, you mean, that means you need the cube root of x to be negative 2. So x equals negative 8 would get that job done. The cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. So that makes the numerator 0, and then again x makes the denominator 0. So let's go ahead and put those two numbers on a sign chart for the first derivative. We're going to do one for the second derivative eventually, so we'll call this f prime chart. You've got the negative 8 from the numerator, so, yeah, from the numerator, and a 0 from the denominator. And then we don't have really a, a very nice test point anywhere, because 0 is my favorite, and it's already a critical point. So I'm going to pick something just like a big number. Say I plugged 1,000 in for x cubed, and we'll do that in this uh, form right here. So if I put 1,000 in there, the cube root of 1,000 is 10. So I'd get 10 in both of those spots, so I'd get 12 over 10, and the key thing there is that it's positive. So if I put in a big number like 1,000, which is to the right of 0, this would be positive. And then as I cross over the 0 critical point, 
that comes from this denominator, which is x to the one-third. And when you're thinking about is that like an odd power or an even power, you focus on the numerator. And the numerator there is the one, which is odd. So you should get a sign change when you cross over that x to the one-third factor. And so since we have plus on the right, that'll be minus on the left. And then the numerator, that one's a little awkward because we have this x to the one-third, but then it's a plus two. So let's just go ahead and do a test point there. We'll, we'll plug in negative 1,000. And let's think about what happens with the negative 1,000. Negative 1,000 right here, the cube root of negative 1,000 would be negative 10. So both of these spots would be negative 10. Numerator would be negative 10 plus 2, which is negative 8. And then that would be over negative 10. It would be a negative over a negative, so that would be a positive. So there's our completed sign chart for the first derivative. I do want to add a couple things here. One of them is that the negative 8 came from the numerator. So that's a horizontal tangent spot. So that could be a max or a min. And then you know, let's go ahead and write ht there for horizontal tangent. And the zero on our sign chart came from the denominator. So the derivative is undefined there. So what's interesting though, is if you go to the original function and you plug zero in, that is defined. So this is not a vertical asymptote. What it is, is a vertical tangent. And I'm not going to put an open circle there because it's defined in the original function. So there is a point on the graph there, but we're going to get a vertical tangent line rather than a vertical asymptote there. So that one could potentially be a max or min if there's a sign change. And as we see on the chart, there is a sign change. So let's analyze this a little bit more. We're increasing here. And then as we leave negative eight, we're decreasing. So we have a horizontal tangent and a local max at negative eight. As we go into zero from the left, we're going down. And as we leave, we're going up. And it's not a horizontal tangent, but we're still decreasing in and increasing out. So we're going to have a local min there. So I'll have to think about what that looks like. That's kind of a new one for us, a vertical tangent and a local min at the same time. But we'll deal with that as we move along, and concavity will, will help us um, investigate that some too. But before we head to the second derivative and the concavity issues, we're going to look at our local max and local min. So the local max is occurring at negative 8, and we want to find out what that local max is by plugging negative 8 into the original function. All right, so our original function from the top was y equals x plus 3 times x raised to the 2 thirds. So that's where we want to plug the negative 8. So that would be negative 8 plus 3 times negative 8 to the 2 thirds. And then we just need to simplify that to see what our y value is going to be. So our y ends up being that negative 8 plus 3 times the cube root of negative 8 and then squared. So we have negative 8 plus 3 times, let's see, the cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. If you take that negative 2 and square it, you get 4. So we have negative 8 plus 12, which would be a positive 4. So there's the other point for our local max. The y-coordinate is that local max is 4 occurring at negative 8, and so we have this ordered pair negative 8, 4. So that takes care of the local max. How about the local min? So for the local min, we want to plug in 0. That's going to be easier to do. So if you plug 0 into this original function right here, you get a 0 in both places. So we end up with 0, 0. And that takes care of our analysis of the first derivative. We've got our max and min figured out. We've got our increasing and decreasing figured out. So now we want to go check on the second derivative. All right, so for y double prime, we want to take the derivative of the first derivative. And so where's the best place to do that? I would say right here, this version of the derivative is the easiest one to take the second derivative of. So that's where I'm going to focus. So derivative of the 1 is 0. 
and then we bring the negative one-third down times the two that's already there, and then the x, we subtract one from its power, so negative one-third minus one would make that negative four-thirds. And then just some quick simplification on that. We can put the negative two in the numerator and the three in the denominator, and then also the x to the negative four-thirds we can move down as x to the positive four-thirds and have that in the denominator. Then we want to do a sign chart. So the only critical point or key number that we get here is when the denominator equals zero. The numerator is a constant, so it's never zero. Denominator is going to be zero when x equals zero. And then we want to do some testing on that. So if you plug a number in like 1, 1 to the 4 thirds will still be 1, and then the negative 2 and the 3 would still be there for negative 2 thirds. So 1, which is on the right, produces a negative second derivative. And as you cross over the 0, that means you're crossing over this factor. And because that factor is raised to the 4th, that 4 thirds, the numerator part of the exponent, the 4, is even, so you are not going to get a sign change right there. So that means we're going to have negative on the other side as well, which is interesting because it means our graph is always concave down, both to the left of 0 and to the right of 0. So we don't actually have any points of inflection because we don't have any changes in concavity. But we do have lots of special points that we'd want to plot. We've got our local minimum at 0, 0, and in addition to be a local minimum, that's also a vertical tangent. We've got our local maximum at negative 8, 4, and then we have a y-intercept, sorry, an x-intercept at negative 27, 0, and then our other xy-intercept was 0, 0. So we want to summarize all of that stuff on the graph. And because we have a negative 27, we need to definitely leave some room to the left. And if you look at our other key points, 0, 0, negative 8, 4, those are either at the origin or to the left. So all of our key points are to the left. So because of that, I'm going to go ahead and draw my axes a little bit to the right, making some extra room on the left. So I'll draw vertical axis here. For the horizontal axis, since we have, what do we have there? Our local max was at negative 8, 4. That's not very high, so we can just number in ones. And we can go ahead and draw a horizontal axis here. That should work okay. So there's our x-axis and our y-axis. And we can go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on the vertical. That'll be fine to plot a point that only goes up to 4. But we, need, we have an x equals negative 8 to graph, and we also have an x equals negative 27 to graph. So how about if we go 5, 10, 15, negative 20, negative 25, 30, 35, 40. That'll allow us to fit in that negative 27. We don't have points on the other side, but that would be the same, 5, 10, 15, 20, and we'll throw... The negative notches in here, one, two, three, four. All right, so uh, another thing that we could look at before we start to graph is there an odd or even nature to this graph? So we can check that by looking at the original exponents, x to the first there, x to the two-thirds here, which is confusing because it's a fraction, but focus on the numerator of that exponent, the square. So we've got a squared there. And we've got a 1 to the other side, so I don't think we're going to have any odd or even symmetry. So we're just going to try and graph from all the information we have. I always like to start off with ordered pairs, so I'll do that here. Let's make those red just so they get our attention. So we had 0, 0 for an x and y intercept. We had left 27 and up 0, so that would be right around here for an intercept. And then the only other special point we really had was our local max, which was negative 8 and 4. So left 8 up 4 would be right about there. So now let's start thinking about drawing it. So let's look at our zero, or sorry, our critical points. At negative, 
Let me scroll this a little. So if we look at our sign chart for the first derivative at negative 8, the derivative was 0 for a horizontal tangent. But at 0, it was undefined for a vertical tangent. So how do I leave here the max with a horizontal tangent and end up at that min and stay concave down? How about something like this? And if we blend in with the axis as we approach, if we blend in with the y-axis, we create that vertical tangent sort of look. Come out of here horizontally, trying to go hit the x-intercept on the left and draw something maybe like that. Is that going to fit? Well, it's concave down, and we said our graph was going to be concave down everywhere. And if we look at some other features here on our sign chart, we're supposed to be increasing until we get to negative 8. That's increasing until we get to negative 8. So that looks good. How about on the other side of the y-axis? We need to, to leave there in an increasing fashion and never reach another max or anything. So that's going to increase away with a vertical tangent and a concave down shape because remember our graph is concave down everywhere. So we have to leave that minimum with a vertical tangent increasing and concave down. So go kind of along the axis, bending downward, but continuing to go upward. So the bend is downward, but the graph is still going up. So there's my attempt at the graph. Now we just want to kind of double check all the pieces. So our function is supposed to increase. So again, let's look at, let me highlight for you a little bit. So we're supposed to increase, decrease, increase. Increase, decrease, increase. Did we do that with a horizontal tangent at negative 8? Yes. And a vertical tangent at 0, 0? Yes. So it looks like we got all the first derivative stuff matching. And the second derivative is actually much easier because it's just supposed to be concave down everywhere. So did we do concave down everywhere? That's a downward bend. That's a downward bend. Again, it can be a little bit confusing to say it's a downward bend on the right when it's going up, but if you look at a tangent line somewhere, I'm sorry about that, let's get the pencil. If you look at a tangent line here and you bent that to match the graph, that would be a downward bend to make that happen. So that really is a concave down portion of the graph, despite the fact that it's an upward increasing portion of the graph at the same time. All right, with these messy ones and this one being kind of new, probably good to look at it on the graphing calculator. So let's switch over there real quick. So let's enter in our original function. So we had for the beginning x plus 3 times x raised to the 2 thirds. When you have a fractional exponent on the graphing calculator, make sure you put it in parentheses so the whole thing is your exponent. Before I hit graph, I'm going to set the window. So second window, I just want it to match what I had on my grid. So I had a negative 40 on the left and 20 on the right. And I went down to negative 4 for my minimum. And I went up to, it looks like, 8 for my maximum. Scale doesn't really matter. I'll change that to a 1. Hit graph. That basically looks like our graph, especially over here on the left. Seems like we did kind of a really nice job with all that. We have our local max right there. We get that to click in. Um, at negative 8, 4, for some reason, the rounding's a little off in this calculator, but we know that was at negative 8. See how it comes in really steep there for our vertical tangent? But then we do have the minimum at 0, 0. And as we leave, it goes up a lot steeper than what I drew, but it really is concave down like I drew. And to see that, let's see if we can zoom out far enough, you'll eventually see that, that bend start to happen. So I guess it's a very subtle concave down, more subtle than what I had on my graph. We can switch back to that. But really, it's okay because all the features of my graph match what we found out from the first derivative and second derivative. So I'm not going to change this answer, but we did just find out that the truth is it comes out of here and goes 
a lot steeper and concave down. But it's very hard to know that from the information that we had. So as long as everything that you draw on your graph matches all of your work with your derivatives, I'm not going to mark it wrong because you did it a little less steep or steeper than it should have been, as long as all the key traits are there. Okay, that wraps up this one. All right, we're going to go ahead and apply our process to one more example. y equals x times the square root of 2 minus x squared. In this one, we run into some domain issues right away that we haven't seen on our previous examples. We have a square root, and so when you have an even root, you have to worry about the underneath piece being negative and creating not a real number situation. So let's investigate our domain by saying whatever is underneath that square root, the 2 minus x squared part, we need that to be greater than or equal to zero. So how do we figure out where that happens? There's a few different techniques for it. One is to make a sign chart, kind of like we do for derivative or second derivative, but we're gonna make it just for that two minus x squared. So first we'd wanna know where is that equal to zero, which could move the x squared. If you set it equal to zero and then solve, you get two equals x squared, which leads you to x equals plus or minus root two. So those are like kind of key numbers for the sign chart. And I'm gonna go ahead and make the sign chart and then we always run into that question, what's the sign chart for? And this one's an interesting one. It's not for y prime, it's not for y double prime, it's not even for y. So I'm gonna write off to the side what it is for. It's for two minus x squared because we wanna know when is that negative and when is it positive. So. I'm going to put my two key numbers on there, negative root 2 and positive root 2. And then I'm just going to fill in the sign chart for this 2 minus x squared piece. So we'll test a number in there like 0. And if I plug 0 into this, sorry, what's going on there? If I plug 0 in right here, then I get 2 for that expression, which means that I'm getting a positive right here. And then if I plug in something to the right of square root of 2, like say the number 4, I get 2 minus 16, which would be negative. If I plug negative 4 into that spot, I'd get 2 minus 16, which would also be negative. So with the domain, we want to make sure that we're getting an x that is greater than or equal to 0. So that would be the plus section. And notice it's greater than or equal to 0. So what does that mean? It means that the endpoints are going to be included in what we want. So we want these endpoints because that's where the inside part is zero, and we want anywhere it's positive, which is in between them. So our domain for this is only going to be from negative root 2 to 2. So most of the functions we've been graphing so far in this section had the entire real numbers as their domain, or maybe just like a, a blip taken out where there was a vertical asymptote but here we've got a limited portion that the graph exists on. Okay, so more time than usual spent on domain. Let's move on to the intercepts now. So start off looking for what happens if you plug in zero into the function. So if you put zero into the original function, that would go here and here. You'd get zero times root two, which would just be zero. So we get zero, zero, and that's at the origin. So that is both an x and a y intercept. So that's a two for one on that. And then you'd also want to set the expression equal to zero to find any other x intercepts. And if you take x times the square root of two minus x squared and set it equal to zero, well, if that front piece is zero, you're going to get a zero for this. We already have that one though, that's right here. What about if this part is zero? Well, that's gonna happen when x equals plus or minus root two. So we're picking up a couple extra x-intercepts. We've got the double in the xy-intercept occurring at zero, zero. And then we have an x-intercept at negative root two, zero. And another one at root two, zero. And it's nice to have some solid points to help us when it comes to graphing. Okay, next step would be to take the first derivative and just kind of jumping up here and looking at 
the original function, what would that entail? We'd write the square root piece as an x to the one half, but then there's a product rule. So we'd have some product rule, power rule, chain rule going on, and then a lot of simplification. And they went ahead and did all that for us and gave us the y prime. So we're just going to accept that gift and start from there. It's all stuff we know how to do, but it is messy and time consuming. The derivative they gave us does need a little bit of simplification still. The numerator is the difference of squares and can be factored. So I'll do that as 1 minus x, 1 plus x. The denominator I'm going to leave just as they gave it to us. But I do want us to keep in, in mind the whole time that there's two places where that denominator is equal to 0. And that's at plus or minus root 2. All right, so let's make a sign chart for f prime. Or in this case, I guess we didn't have an f, but a y. So for y prime, let's make a sign chart. So we have negative root 2 and positive root 2 as both boundaries of the domain and places where the derivative becomes undefined. The original function was defined there. But now if you put in the negative root 2 or root 2, you're getting a 0 in the denominator. So what does that mean? That means we're getting vertical tangents at the endpoints of our graph. And then inside, we've got the plus or minus 1 as critical numbers. On the outsides, that's not part of our domain. So we could actually take the outside pieces and just say that's all gone. So none of this part out here exists on our graph. So when we're testing, we'd want to not test anything that was outside of the domain. Easiest place to start off the testing process would be with zero. So what happens if we put zero into the derivative? So if we put a zero here, here, and here, what would we get? 2 times 1 times 1 up top for a 2, positive up top, and on the bottom square root of 2, which is positive, so it looks like a positive over a positive. So this would be pluses in here. I'm going to switch that to blue, but those would be pluses. And then what about when we cross over some of these critical points? So what about when we cross over negative 1? That comes from... Let's see, that's positive 1. That comes from this factor, which is raised to the first. That's an odd power. So we're going to have different signs on the two sides of the 1. How about when we cross over this negative 1? That comes from this factor, which is also to the first power. So we're going to have different signs on both sides of that. And negative 1 and 1 make the derivative 0, so we're going to have horizontal tangents at those two places. And the other thing we're going to have is extrema, because we go down on the way in and then up on the way out. So that looks like a local min. And then we are going up into negative 1 and down on the way out. So hard to squeeze that in, but that's going to be a local max. I'll write it below, I guess. So we're going to have a local minimum at negative 1, local maximum at positive 1, and vertical tangents at the end of our domain at negative 2 and 2. And we'd want to figure out what is the ordered pair for the local min and the max. So we'll go ahead and do that work. So we'll start off with the local minimum. That's going to be, here, let me find out what is the local minimum. The local minimum is whatever the y value is. So if you plugged in a negative 1, there's not officially an f function here, but let's suppose that we named the function up above f of x. So then we plug negative 1 in, and let's see, what was the original function? x times the square root of 2 minus x squared. So that would be negative 1 for the x times the square root of 2 minus x squared, which would be negative 1 squared. So we have a negative 1 out front, and then we have, what is that, the square root of 2 minus 1, so the square root of 1, all that just works out to be negative 1. So what does that mean for us in terms of an ordered pair? 
The input is negative 1, and so is the output. So we have a local min occurring at negative 1, negative 1. All right, and then how about the local max? So for the local max, we would do the same thing, but we would plug in the positive 1 into the function. And if you do that, you're going to end up with 1 times the square root of 2 minus 1. So you're going to end up with 1 times 1. So 1, 1 will be our ordered pair for the local max. All right, so that finishes our analysis of the first derivative. So we head to the second derivative. And for the second derivative, we would want to think about where is that equal to 0. So let's take that second derivative and write it down. So they told us that y double prime was equal to 2 times x times x squared minus 3 all over the square root of 2 minus x squared to the third. All right, so a couple things about that. Where is that second derivative undefined? That'd be the plus or minus root 2, because we have the same basic key factor in the denominators we've had in our previous derivative. So plus or minus root 2. We have a 0 in the numerator when x equals 0. And we'd get another one when x is equal to plus or minus root 3. But plus and minus root 3 are bigger than plus or minus root 2. So what, what's important about that? That means they're not in the domain. Because the domain of this function only goes from negative root 2 to positive root 2. So negative at root 3 is to the left of that. Positive root 3 is to the right of that. So even though that seems to be a key point for our derivative, it's not in the domain, so we don't have to worry about it. All right, so let's take the pieces we do need to worry about and put them on a sign chart for our second derivative. So this one is y double prime. We've got 0 as a key factor from the numerator to put on there. And then we have the negative root 2 and the positive root 2. And yes, the negative root 3 and positive root 3, but they're kind of over here in the no man's land part of this that is not in the domain. So that's why we're not going to worry about sign changes out there. All right, so unfortunately we can't plug in 0. We do have a reasonably nice number to plug in, which would be 1 or a negative 1. So let's think about plugging in 1. So second derivative, if I plug in a 1, would be 2 times 1 times 1 squared minus 3. Terrible 3, sorry about that. Over the square root of 2 minus 1 squared. And then all of that would be to the third. All we care about is the sign. So the top is 2 times 1 minus 3. That would be a negative up top. The bottom is 2 minus 1 raised to powers and square roots, but the bottom of that is going to be a 1. So we have a negative up top and a 1 in the bottom. So overall, at 1, we're getting a negative sign. You can just plug those into the calculator, too, if you don't like to think it through the way I just did. Either way is okay. What about when we cross over 0? So that 0 is coming from, let me do that in a different color, that 0 is coming from this 2x, and that x is raised to the first power. When you have an odd power on the factor producing your key point, you should get a sign change as you cross over that. So we should have positive on this side. So concave up to the left of the 0 point, concave down on the other side, and so that means at 0, we've got a point of inflection. So, point of inflection is 0 comma something, and we've already plugged the 0 into the function way back up at the top. 0, 0 is what you get for that. So, 0, 0 is a point of inflection. All right. Let's try and pick a color we haven't used a ton of and mark all the points that are known. So we have 0, 0 is both the x and y intercept, but also a point of inflection. 
We've got a local minimum occurring at negative 1, 1, and a local maximum occurring at 1, 1. So those are a couple solid points that we'll want to graph. And then we have x-intercepts at the endpoints of our domain at plus or minus root 2, comma 0. And plus and minus root 2, those are like approximately 1.414 ish type of numbers. So we'll, we can think of that decimal version as we go to graph it. All right, so let's go ahead and give an attempt at the graph. So I'll start off with our coordinate system. So I'm just going to do an x-axis through the middle. And eh, not thrilled with that one. Let me try again. x-axis through the middle. Decent enough. Y-axis through the middle. Brilliant. All right, so there's our X and Y axis. So how about scale? So the biggest number we have on our horizontal is the root 2 and negative root 2, which is like 1.14. I don't want to jam everything up like between here and here by going 1, 2, 3. So I'm going to spread it out a little bit and go, let's do every third one. So we'll go 1, 2, 3 and call that a 1. And then 1, 2, 3, and that's a 2. When the biggest number you have is still pretty small, it's nice to spread out the numbering so that your graph doesn't get too squished together. So this is going to help us do that. When you look at those ordered pairs that we did, the highest and lowest y values we got were a plus 1 and a minus 1. So I'm going to go up three notches here for a 1. Just make this a 2. And then down three notches for the negative one, and down three more would be the negative two. Let's plot our fixed known points in red. So we'll start off with our intercepts. We have zero, zero, and then plus or minus root two, comma, zero. So 1.414 would be right about here for the root two. Um, halfway in between 1 and 2 would be 1.5, so I just want to be a little short of that. The first tick mark after 1 is 1 1.333, so that seems like a decent location. The other side should be symmetric because it's the same number, just a negative value, so that would be right about there. Those are vertical tangents, so we're going to want to leave and arrive at those values very steeply because they were zeros in the denominator of our first derivative. That's why we know. We have that steepness. And then left one down one is going to be a minimum. And right one up one is going to be a maximum. All right, and then how about our concavity? So I, I can kind of see just real quick, I'm going to erase this after I do it, but there's got to be some sort of pattern that, that kind of goes like this, you know, something roughly. So does that idea fit our sign chart. Yeah, we're going to go on this sign chart here. It's going to decrease, increase, and then decrease again. That that works with the dot to dot I just played. And on our concavity, we have up on the left, down on the right. I think that matches too. And a point of inflection at zero, zero. So let's give it a try. I'm going to leave my left boundary very steeply because it's supposed to be a vertical tangent. I'm going to bend into a horizontal tangent as I go through the minimum and keep that bending going as we head towards the point of inflection. Now when I cross that point of inflection, I want to change the bend from upward to downward as I flatten out to go into that other key point, which was a local max. And then I'm going to bend downward towards our other x-intercept and try and go in there in a vertical style because of the fact that the under the derivative was undefined at that point. So there's my uh, try. And just kind of mapping it through with the first derivative. Decreasing, increasing, decreasing. That's a match with the sign chart right down there. And then concavity is easier to track. For concavity, we just had up on the left, down on the right. So let's make sure that's what we have. We've got a concave up bend here, followed by a concave 
down as we leave there. Sorry. Concave down there, up there, concave down there. So those pieces are matching. And then we did other things like vertical tangents on the endpoints, horizontal tangents at the max and min. I think we've nailed it. The other thing that I noticed, though, is it kind of seems to have a symmetry. Notice that if it's pick a new color here. Let's go with green. If I take a point, sorry, if I take green, I pick a point right here and I draw through the origin, it seems like there's a mirror image point on the other side. So that looks like symmetry through the origin. That should happen if our function was odd, which we didn't talk about as we went through, but it seems to have that look to it. So let's test this function to see if, in fact, it is really and truly odd. So we've got a little bit of space down here. Let's replace the x in the function by negative x and see what happens. So this would be 2 minus negative x squared. So what happens if I simplify that? Well, the negative x would just be a negative and then the x. And if you take the negative x inside the square root and you square that, the negative goes away and you get here. And notice that what I end up with right here is the same thing as I started with, except has a negative in the front. And we said originally that if you take the x in a function and replace it by negative x and you end up getting the negative of what you started with, that's an odd function. So if we noticed that before, we could have kind of used that symmetry to our advantage. I didn't notice it till after I would graphed it that it had that symmetry, but there's an example of us checking it. And then one final thing, let's just take a look at the graph on the calculator, make sure it looks like we did a decent job. So let's clear out the last one and go with the new one, x times the square root of, and what do we have, 2 minus x raised to the second. Okay, and then for our window, we went with negative 2 to 2 for our left-right boundaries. Sorry, I was in the wrong spot there. Negative 2 to 2 for the x boundaries, and negative 2 to 2 is what we use for the y boundaries. Let's hit graph. Uh, looks like we did a pretty good job. So... Notice the concave up section like we had. There's our minimum. Went through the origin, 0, 0. Con switched to concave down at that point. Hit a maximum up here. And notice that it comes into that x-intercept very steeply because of the vertical tangent that's being created by the undefined first derivative. All right, that wraps up section 4.3.